do different exercises build muscle differently? Let's take a look at this brand new research on regional muscle growth. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm looking at a fascinating new study on how performing specific exercises shapes the way our muscles grow. We all know that dumbbell curls and dumbbell rows both train the biceps, but does this mean that they build the muscle in the same way? Well, not necessarily. Muscles don't always grow uniformly and depending on the exercise, one region of a muscle can adapt more than another. This new research tested exactly that by comparing dumbbell curls, which is a bicep isolation movement that places direct tension on the bicep, with dumbbell rows, which is a multi-joint exercise where the bicep acts as a secondary assist by sharing the workload with the larger muscles of the back. Now, the authors weren't just interested in overall growth. They wanted to see whether these exercises would cause different regions of the biceps to grow and whether the muscle that swelled the most after a single workout would also be the one that grew the most after several weeks of training. The idea that exercise selection can influence where a muscle grows has been examined in several studies, but the results aren't always consistent. For the elbow flexors or the biceps specifically, some research has suggested that certain curl variations may produce greater growth in either the proximal or the distal portion of the bicep. However, other studies have reported more uniform adaptations, making it difficult to draw strong conclusions. Similar inconsistencies have been observed in studies looking at the quadriceps, particularly when comparing single joint and multi-joint exercises, where comparisons of squats and leg extensions sometimes show regional differences in hypertrophy. These mixed results led the authors of the present study that I'm reviewing today to ask the following question. How do isolation and compound pulling exercises differ in their effects on regional bicep growth. The dumbbell curl provides direct tension to the elbow flexors across a large range of motion, while the dumbbell row involves some of the same muscle groups but as more of a supporting role, with the load primarily distributed across the back musculature. By comparing these two exercises, the authors set out to determine not just which exercise produced more growth, but also whether the regions of the muscle adapted differently. They were also interested in whether acute swelling after a single session could predict long-term hypertrophy, testing the common idea that the immediate post-workout pump reflects how much a muscle will eventually grow. To answer these questions, the researchers conducted two experiments. In the acute trial, or experiment one, 16 resistance-trained men completed completed a single training session in which one arm performed dumbbell curls and the other arm performed dumbbell rows. Both exercises were performed as four sets of eight to 12 reps with the loads close to each participant's 10 rep maximum. Both exercises were performed as four sets of eight to 12 reps with the loads close to each participant's 10 rep maximum with all sets taken to failure. Ultrasound scans were taken before and immediately after the workout to measure changes in muscle thickness at both the proximal and and distal regions of the elbow flexors, aka the biceps. The image you can see on the screen is an example of a panoramic ultrasound image showing the two regions of the biceps being analyzed. Following this study, the authors also performed a training study comparing muscle growth adaptations to long-term training with these same two bicep exercises. In the training study, a separate group of nine untrained men participated in an eight-week training program. Twice per week, they trained one arm with dumbbell curls and the other with dumbbell rows. For the first four weeks of the study, they performed four sets of eight to 12 reps, which increased to six sets for the final four weeks, and again, all sets being taken to failure. Ultrasound imaging was performed at baseline and after the intervention to assess long-term changes in muscle thickness in both the proximal and distal regions of the biceps and the brachialis. So let's take a look at the results. What did the authors find? In the acute trial or experiment one, both exercises produced swelling, but the dumbbell curl produced greater increases overall, especially in the upper portion of the muscle. Approximately, muscle thickness increased by about 19% after the curls, compared to 13% after the rows. Distally, bicep curls led to a 16% increase, while the rows produced a 12% increase. The difference between exercises reached statistical significance in the proximal or the upper region 
region, suggesting that bicep curls created greater swelling response in that area. In the training study or experiment two, the results were even clearer. After eight weeks, the dumbbell curl group saw growth across the entire elbow flexors, with muscle thickness increasing by about 5% proximally and 11% distally. The row group showed a similar 5% increase proximally and essentially no change in the distal region, only about 1%, which was not statistically significant. In other words, biceps produced growth both in the upper and lower bicep, while rows mainly influenced the upper portion of the bicep. These findings demonstrate that exercise selection doesn't just influence how a muscle grows, but also where it grows. The curl, being a single joint exercise, placed constant tension directly on the elbow flexors through a large range of motion, which likely explains the more robust growth in the proximal and distal regions. The row, on the other hand, distributed tension across multiple muscle groups, with biceps playing more of a supporting role. This may have been enough to stimulate some growth in the upper region, but not enough to drive meaningful changes distally. An interesting point is that the acute swelling data did not fully predict the long-term training adaptations. Both curls and rows produce swelling across the muscle in the immediate aftermath of training, but only the curls translated into substantial growth at both ends of the muscle. This suggests that swelling can give us clues about which muscles are being worked, but it doesn't necessarily tell us how those muscles will adapt over several weeks of training. So what are the main takeaways from this study? Well, if your goal is to maximize bicep hypertrophy, especially in the lower portion of the muscle, curls appear to be more effective than rows. Rows are still an excellent exercise for back development and do provide some stimulus to the biceps. But if you want fuller development of the biceps, including isolation work like curls may be essential. More broadly, these results remind us that hypertrophy can be regional and not all exercises are interchangeable when it comes to developing a muscle from top to bottom. This is why incorporating a diverse range of movements into your training is likely the best way to ensure each muscle group is fully targeted along its entire length. So that's it for today's breakdown, guys. If you found this study as interesting as I did, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss my next deep dive into the latest training and nutrition research. And I'd love to hear from you guys. Do you usually rely on compound lifts for targeted muscle group training or do you make isolation exercises a regular part of your program? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. And now, if you'd like to support my channel, check out my comprehensive workout library with programs designed for all fitness levels. With hundreds of programs to choose from, you'll find routines tailored to your goals, whether you're training at home or in the gym. Each program comes with clear exercise demonstrations and built-in tools to track your volume and progress over time. To learn more, visit beabody.com. I'll see you in my next video.